everybody just a chance to find uh, Matthew chapter 13 this morning Matthew chapter 13 <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13 we got enough room there if you saw that they can come from each other. Good morning to those of you joining us by way of the internet. Okay, Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. I'm this morning we're going to look at a very familiar parable that I've covered many times. But often these passages come up again and again, or they're needed again and again, or there is more depth to them again and again. So we're going to go over uh, the parable of the sower this morning, and we're going to focus on one of the soils. A lot of times I go through this, and I just cover it in teaching of the four soil types and we talk about the four things, but um, let's go through uh, Matthew chapter one, excuse me, Matthew chapter 13, verse one through nine. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deep deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell on into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. <clears throat> so as, this morning we go through this very familiar parable. We are looking at a person who is sowing, we'll say corn or sowing wheat. They're sowing something, some type of crop. We know as farmers, we know that not every seed comes up. We know as Christians, not every seed we plant grows, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that you don't understand, is not every time you witness to someone, not every time you minister to someone, does it take. Amen? That's right. We get frustrated because we say, this is the all-powerful Word of God. But if that seed, soil is not ready, it will not take. Amen? That's right. Now let's jump ahead to, well, I mean, before I jump, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to look at these four types very quickly. Verse 4, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. So this was on top of the ground. They came in where it was just on, the, we'll say, the walking path, and the birds came. And we know, we know about that, don't we? We've seen corn out, in the, and the crows come out and get it. They'll even dig it up. They'll even wait till a little green comes up and they'll dig that up. But this actually was on the top of the ground and it never germinated. It never had a chance. This, this seed was just taken up. Uh, no product from it. The second was the stony places. Verse 5, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. I want, that is very critical that you understand that because that is the main part of my message today is they sprung up because they were, didn't have much earth. Did you see that? It's because they didn't have much earth that they sprung up. Amen? Amen. Now, the, the, think about that very carefully. The first was on top of the ground. 
never had a chance. The second actually sprung up very quickly because it had a little shallow bit of dirt and rock underneath. Now get in your mind ground area that you're trying to plant and there's, there's bedrock underneath and not much topsoil. We've got areas around our farm here where there's not much grass growing even, but occasionally something will come up. And if you dig down with a shovel, you'll find that it's not much underneath. It's just a little bit of topsoil or a little bit of something, and then there's rock or, or clay, in our instance, underneath. The, because of that, it springs up very quickly. That's a very important part to remember. The third part fell among the thorns verse 7 and the thorns sprung up and choked them up well we understand that that happens doesn't it you can have the best soil and if the thorns are there it comes up and it chokes it out i mean you can plant the most beautiful garden have the perfect soil have the right amount of rain everything's right the fertilizer in the garden or if you're composting and using that everything springs up wonderfully and if it's not tended Right? If it's not tended, the weeds choke it out. That's it. And then the last fells into good ground, brought forth fruit, and it produced a hundredfold, sixtyfold, or thirtyfold. So the last we really don't talk about because that is what we see as a product of Christianity is we see growth. We see people that they have fruit in their lives. Right? So we're really not going to focus on that today. That's the, that's the outcome and the goal that you want in your life. You want fruit in your life. But these other things are problems. Let's focus on these problems this morning and see if we can't get them resolved. Now, Jesus had to go through this parable with his disciples because they didn't understand it. And some of these, some of these parables, they, they're just given... And you have to really think about them. This one is actually explained. It's one of the few parables that Jesus comes back and he sits down with us and he tells us all what he means. It's sort of like a, uh, a fable that you tell and there's a moral at the end of the story and when you get to the end, you tell the moral. And just in case that person didn't understand, right? So let's look in verse 18. We have this very outlined explanation Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. <coughs> so the first one is the person that just goes right over their head. You know, this is these are actually people. This is you and me. These are these are Maybe times of your life and my life when you was just not listening. You was just not paying attention. It just went right over your head. You just were you just was there in church or you was listening to the radio and the and the pastor was giving the message and you just didn't hear it. These are the people that it falls and it never has a chance. You tune the radio on, you turn on the CD, you play the MP3 or the podcast, whatever it is you're hearing the Word of God, you turn it on and it means nothing to you. We've all seen people like that in church, haven't we? Mm -hmm. They sit there week after week. They sit there, they never move, and they leave and next week they're back again and you wonder, why are you even coming here? Right? Why do you even show up in church and it has done nothing for you? It, why, you might as well go out and have some fun because you're not getting anything done here. Right. But yet people will sit there and they'll listen year after year to the Word of God. And I don't know what's going on in their head, but it's certainly not the Word of God. Yeah. I don't know what's happening in their life, but it is hard as a rock. It's like the concrete parking lot where if you scattered some seed out there, nothing's going to grow. It's frustrating as a pastor to throw the seed out only to have that person be a concrete parking lot. Mm -hmm. And you, you feel like this effort is wasted. So this is the first person. And he said that the, that the, uh, the crows came or the birds came and 
and uh, ate that. Now that is dissolved by anything that, because there's nothing that takes it into the soil. There's no root that takes place that draws that seed into the soil. There's no place for that seed to go and the birds eat it and it's gone. That passage that you have spread over your sons and daughters, if they're, if they're like this, is not taking root. Now we say that sometimes to comfort people whose children are in, out in the left field. We say, you know, well, you know, the word will not return void, right? But the truth is, and I'm gonna be honest with you because you need to know this, the truth is, if it has not taken root, the enemy has already come and taken it away. Right. And the years and years of sharing the gospel, spreading the word, you know, giving scripture, someone hearing it, if it's not ever listened to, down the road is not going to germinate. Right. It's not there. You and I know as Christians, as mature Christians, and Christians who are fighting to grow, that it takes constant effort. Do you really think that the word of God goes out in that person's life? They are zoned out into the world. They are not hearing any of it. And that, well, we just hope some of it takes effect. And down the road, that they're just going to go, wow, and all that seed's just going to fall in? It's not there. Mm -hmm. The enemy's already taken it away. I'm not telling you that to discourage you. I'm telling you that there is a solution to this, and we're going to find it in the next few passages. Verse 20, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So this passage, and in the first section, Jesus gives, gives more language to, more words to, than any of the other four, uh, three souls. He talks this one, about this one more than any of the rest of them. So I want to focus on that this morning. This is the soil that I want to focus on is stony places. And that's the title of my message today is stony places. <clears throat> he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon or very quickly, very shortly with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, underlined because of the word, by and by he is offended. Okay, so we're given the example of the stony place, the hard place, that this little bit of soil. Because of the lack of depth, it germinates very quickly. Now, let me ask you this. Anybody here ever seen someone that came in, even to this church, they came into your life, you talked to them one time, and they're like, wow, yes, that's what I want. Yes, I've got it. And immediately they have it, and then you saw later on they went away from Christ. We all know somebody like that, don't we? Yeah. We know people that they come in, and they're, they're very flighty. They go from one thing to another. They go from yoga to Christianity to Buddhism to atheism. I mean, they're just like, you know, I don't understand you. You are going from one concept to another, not even one faith to another. I mean, we're going from believing in God to not believing in God, and you're one week you're a Christian, next week you're Jew. I don't understand this. This is the answer to that question because there's a little bit of depth. It, it germinates very quickly. Now, I ask my master gardener these kind of questions. How can the soil that's very shallow actually take root quicker. And it's because the water is held. Like when it rains just a couple of inches below the soil, there's water. It doesn't, it doesn't drain into the, the soil. It holds there. So you've actually got a little moist pocket. So that area in far as the, the agriculture side of it, the seed germinates very quickly. And it's very exciting, isn't it? It's very exciting to see someone that just seems to just like, you tell them one time, and wow, they've got it. And you think, they're going to take off and run with Christ, and they don't. The answer's right here. They have no depth. They are a shallow person. They are someone that is flighty from one thing to another. It's like, 
Give me some wheat. Give me some corn. I'll, okay, I'll just germinate that. It's germination all the time, but there's never any product from it. It's constant, a little bit of growth here, a little bit of growth here, and nothing ever produces from it. That's a sad plot to yes. plan on. That's a sad person to try to sow seed into. It's frustrating as a pastor to see people like this. They have no depth. Now, it's, it's very frustrating to see someone you're casting seed out and it's just bouncing off and they're just, they're just staring at you with that blank stare. They're just, they'll look right through you. That's sad, but it is frustrating to know that there's a little bit of depth there. And it could work. It could work. This could happen to someone that the root could get down in and there'd be depth and all of a sudden this field is going to grow. Amen? Amen. And he said because of the word, he, he goes through tribulation or persecution and by and by he's offended by and by, he's offended. Because the word is planted there, there's a test. And the test is to see, is this person really going to continue on with Christ? We have so many people that go down to join a church, or they're even baptized, and then they think they're good to go. That's this person. They didn't want any kind of relationship with Christ. They just didn't want to go to hell. They just are in the moment. They're listening to the message. And like I said, I'm not trying to discourage people, but if you do not see fruit in someone's life, they are not born again. Right. It's as simple as that. When you have depth, when you continue to grow, that is reason to believe that person is in Christ because of the fourth soul. <clears throat> And very quickly, I'll continue through the rest of this, but we're going to get on to the next section of my message. Verse 23, He that receiveth, receive seed into the good ground, excuse me, 22, He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So the other was thorns sprung up. Now, in this passage, you can have very good ground, but the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this world choke it out. You can have good depth and good understanding and spend time with it, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Now think about those two things. The cares of this world, it literally, literally means anxieties, the worries of this world. Not the busyness of this world, but the worries of this world. So there's worries. And on the other side is the deceitfulness of riches. And I say that's the other side because the deceitfulness of riches is, I don't really need Jesus anymore. I'm, I'm good. Lord, you can just go on to the next person because I'm good here. You can just move on because I've now, I've got wealth. I'm healthy, my family's okay, we've got a nice home. Thank you, God, you can move on. And when you do that, it's the deceitfulness of riches and the thorns start growing up. Mm -hmm. I have seen families destroyed because they came into money. And I've seen families destroyed because of the cares of this world. They just worried about everything. And he said, casting all your cares on me, on him, because he cares for you, amen? So when we do that, we are just as guilty either way. If we get off in one side and we and we uh, we just think we're okay because hey everything's good right now, we're we're going to fall into sin. And if we get on the other side of the ditch and we say, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do, God. You said you're going to take care of me, but I just don't know. I just don't know. You are allowing weeds and thorns to come into your life, yes. and all that product will be destroyed it will be choked out and in this situation you don't want that as a christian you can't be in fear and anxiety and worry all the time any of the time amen, amen. now we often have things that are just life 
changing kind of threats, things that worry us. And we often say, I don't know how to not worry. Casting your cares on him. Casting your cares on him. You know, we're like a child who says, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to eat. And the mama says, I'm going to take care of you. I've already got it cooking, son. And the little boy says, I just don't know how I'm going to eat. I, don't, I just, I'm very hungry and I just don't know when it's going to be ready. I just don't know how I'm going to eat, where my next meal is going to come from. It's just ridiculous that Christians worry about things. True. Now, don't get me wrong. I have worried many times about things and it's gripped me. But then I always go back to my analogy of we get to a stop sign and traffic's like this and we panic and we say, how do I get out of this? How am I ever going to get past this? This is this. Here's another stop sign, and and I don't, and all of a sudden this stop sign, I really don't know how I'm going to get across this traffic. It dawned on me one day when I was starting to drive in Birmingham that everybody that went before me got through there, and it was so dumb for me to believe that I was not going to get across this intersection. I was the one up in front. Maybe I had been behind the traffic and it moved forward and I got up there and think, I really don't know how I'm going to get across here. Stop worrying. You've been through this before. Amen. 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 You've been through this before and you'll be through it again. In verse 23, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and beareth forth, bring forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Now, I said I wasn't going to spend much time on these, but it bears the need to tell you that when it germinates, everybody doesn't bring forth the same fruitfulness. Every ground does not bring forth the same product as the next field. Now, you may see <coughs> your neighbor's garden, and you get jealous over it, and you say, my garden looks just terrible. It's waist high and stuff, and I work it constantly, and I just, I mean, the rain gets, is, I get busy with, I mean, you just are so frustrated with your garden, and I just, we, we got a bushel of corn this morning, literally here, we got a bushel of corn, it's in the kitchen, and we've got three rows out there, three short rows, and we got a bushel of corn, and we're going to be having it for lunch, by the way, so y'all hang around, but that corn really doesn't look that good because we've had weeds in there because it's rained a lot. We've been in Birmingham with Aaron and been in the hospital and we were busy with that and the new babies and there's been some sickness and I mean, on and on and on things, right? We're, we're so down about this, about what our garden looks like, but guess what? We got a bushel of corn in here. Mm -hmm. and you can say, well, Farmer John up the road, he got 20 bushels of corn. That's the way we are as humans is we try to compare. Instead of just looking at the harvest, we look at our children, we look at our friends, we look at our spouse, and we say, you know, there's not much fruit there. But is there fruit? Is there fruit? Did it produce something? Now, when you think about that, I'm telling you, don't get discouraged about those you've got seed in and you've seen grow, and, and they're, maybe they're immature Christians, but they're Christians and they've got a little fruit. Amen? And if you've got fruit one time, you're going to keep getting fruit. Amen? That's right. Because the soil is right. And it, even if it's a struggle, some of you need to hear me on this, even if it's a struggle, guess what? It's a struggle for everybody. It's a struggle for everybody. Right. And you've got some uh, well-equipped farmer who's got this massive John Deere tractor, and it's 16 rows wide, and he goes in and he plants 16 rows at a time. Then he comes back and he tills 16 rows at a time. Then he comes back with a combine, and he harvests 16 rows at a time. And you have, you're out there with a push plow or a tiller or a hoe. Don't get discouraged. Right? right? I mean, Billy Graham had thousands of people come down and, and pray. And there may be some little pastor or some little little woman out in the country and she just doesn't have much of a mission field and she prays. She's only one over one person in her life. I'm telling you, you need to look at that. That's harvest. That's 
That's Amen. right. Amen. Now, I told you that I was going to focus on one of these today. We're going to look at the stony places. So I began to ponder last night, what makes depth in people? What makes depth? How do you get a person to be a person of depth? You know, we, we all know people, in the general sense, they're just surface people. When you meet them, your relationship with them may be a surface. But it may be because they are a surface person. They are, they're never deep with anybody. You come up, and every time you see them, hey, uh, you know, weather's nice, isn't it? Your relationship with them is surface. They're surface people. You, ha you cannot get depth with them. I went through trying to find out some answers and looking for scripture and trying to find a passage on depth. Now we've got the parable of the four soils, but I want, I want you to think about depth in your life and then you can move on to depth in the person that, that you struggle with because I think that's what we're looking at here. If we're Christians, when we're studying the parable of the four soils, we're really interested in how to get harvest. You know, Jesus is planting the seed, but we carry that seed too, right? We minister. It's our responsibility to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We are, as Christians, little Christ, the one who bear the message. And so we're looking at being a gardener this morning, being a spiritual gardener, and we're trying to get harvest. So how do you get depth in something? Well, I can go out to my garden plot and I can if I say, well, it's got to be turned. It's hard as a rock. Every spring, I have to go out and turn it. Now, I've been blessed with a, a nice tractor, the plows that I need, two or three plows, I can turn it and then disc it, smooth it in. I've got a small tiller. We've got some implements to do that with, but there are people that literally use a shovel. It's a level. Got Haley raising her hand. You go out and you double dig. Haley learned this a long time ago. You double dig, right? Yep. That's just what you do. You double dig. You dig and you throw and you throw and you throw and you start the next row and you dig and you throw and you throw and you basically are turning it with a shovel. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You grow food. Amen. Right? Doesn't take any gasoline. Slower, but you can produce. It's good exercise. Amen. Amen. So that person in your life, you can get, you may not have the tools that the massive farmer has, but you can get depth. Amen. Now, I found this great article last night, and oddly enough, I'll say that to preempt this, it was not a Christian article. It was more of just a general psychology about people with depth. And it was five traits that deep people have that shallow people don't. And I, I read, I thought, okay, that'll be interesting. I read through the five topics and it was fascinating because every time I read one, the Holy Spirit said, that goes along with this scripture. That goes along with this scripture. And every time I read one, and I thought, this is gold right here. This is the answer to trying to get depth. So here are, here are <coughs> the world's five traits that deep people have that shallow people don't. And I'm going to show you scriptures that go along with these. So if you're right, taking notes, you can make five headings. Leave, your space, leave yourself space for a couple of scriptures below each one. The number one trait that deep people have that shallow people don't is deep people see beyond appearances. Deep people see beyond appearances. I'm going to go through all five of these, and then we're going to go back to them and give you the scripture. Deep people see beyond appearances number two deep people don't believe everything they hear or see deep people don't believe everything they hear or see now that sounds like rebellion sometimes but i'm i'm going to get into this in just a minute and show you that that's actually a godly trait number three deep people listen more than they speak Deep people listen more than they speak. Number four, 
Deep people think through the consequences of their behavior. Deep people think through the consequences of their behavior. And number five, deep people work to get past their egos. Deep people work to get past their egos. Now, I promised scripture for these, so let's go back to number one. Deep people see beyond appearances, and let's look at John 7, 24. John 7, 24. Book of John, chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. We also have James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, if you want to write that down. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. My brethren... Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you, your assembly, a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit there under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? And we know that Jesus told us to judge righteous judgment and don't judge according to appearance. We are terrible as human, and it, humans, and it's a carnal trait for us to judge someone on appearance. Sometimes I wish we were all blind physically because we would judge better judgment on someone's character. We have a terrible time of thinking someone is better than they actually are because they're wearing nice clothes, because they smell nice, because they are attractive to us, because they have a great speaking voice. We judge all the time based on appearance, and we need to stop doing that. For depth in you, you need to understand that everything is not as it seems. That that little widow that has no teeth that's out there who can't speak well and she comes up and she wants to lay hands on you and pray for you, that's the one that's going to get healing. Ooh, amen. That televangelist that's got his $5,000 suit on and he's got gold rings on his fingers and he's impressed you by his appearance, that man is a charlatan, not a man of God. The little humble lady that you meet at the grocery store, the little lady that's next door to you, the man at work that he's always quiet and he doesn't have much of a personality and he doesn't talk about all the things that everybody else talks about and everybody thinks he's a weirdo and that man comes to you and he looks at you and talks to you about Jesus. That's the man, that's the man that is a man of God. Amen. Amen. Judge not according to appearances. James talks about having a man come into your church and he has gold ring and good apparel. And then a man in, in a vile raiment, he says, a man in poor clothes. I mean, imagine a homeless appearing person come in. I've, I've seen videos where pastors dress like homeless people to test his flock and he sat outside. There's, there's one that it comes to mind where he checks to see what his people would do and I think they actually did very well how would you how would you respond to someone if someone stops and asks you for help do you really pray and ask God for discernment or do you just say well they look okay how many people that looked okay turned out to be predators mm -hmm. right turned out to be predators there's a lot of mass murderers that are really nice people, and they they're always interview the people that are the neighbors or the coworkers, and they say, I would never have thought him to be that way. Mm -hmm. Right? Quit judging by, by appearance and start judging righteous judgment and see the people beyond their appearance. 
that's depth. Amen. And number two, deep people don't believe everything they hear or read. Let's look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. <clears throat> And when they had passed through Amphilopus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from, again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved in with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted on the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. So here is a group that some people listened to, and some people didn't. You think, well, okay, that's okay. That's like some of the hundredfold, some of the sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. There was here's some soil that produces something. But I want you to look at in verse ten at the church at Berea. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women which were of the Greek, Greeks and of men, not a few. So here is Thessalonica and here is Berea. And the Bereans were of more noble character because they listened and they went and searched the scriptures. These people don't believe everything they hear or read. How many times have you been in church and something hits you as different than you've ever heard before and you think, wait just a minute, Brother Paul. Wait a minute, I don't know about that. I don't know about this issue. I don't know about that scripture. I've never, wait a minute, I've never heard that before. And you had the audacity to go study it. That's depth. Or if you're like the shallow person, you just follow right along with what the pastor says. I challenge you all to, to always go behind me and study the word. Always go behind and if something's confusing. Don't ever just take what I'm saying at face value. Always go behind me and study the scripture. That's depth. If you're a shallow person, like, Okay, Brother Paul, tell me what this means. And I tell you, and you go, okay. That's, that's shallow. If you've got depth, if you want depth, you're going to study it yourself. Right? People that get degrees and they never do anything with them, they go to college, they go to tech school, and they learn something. Even if they learn it to pass a test, to get a diploma, it will mean absolutely nothing to them if they don't put it into practice. Yes. I remember a few years ago when we had to update a test that we was giving new employees at work. And I was on the group that did that. And we went through about 500 questions of, of a technical nature. And I was amazed at the things that I had learned in technical school that I had forgotten about. There was one um, where the formula uh, had to to do the little rhyme, Eli the Iceman, E-L-I-I-C-E. -I -I -E. And in that Eli the Iceman was something that our instructor gave and everybody from an Air Force technology instructor all the way down to a high school vocational teacher, if you're teaching about current and voltage, current leading voltage in the capacitive circuit, I mean, uh, Eli the Iceman. It was something to help you remember, kind of like the you remember the nine planets by remembering a little poem. And when you, when you have that kind of stuff that you've learned in vacation Bible school through the Bible, amen, and then you have it come back up, you go, wait a minute, I, I read about David and Goliath in Bible school, and, you know, that's children's stuff, isn't it? But then you go back over it, and, hey, there's actually a lesson for adults there, right? 
So don't just don't just accept things on face value, because you need to understand that you study. Look at Proverbs chapter twenty-five, and verse one. Proverbs twenty-five and verse one. Excuse me, verse two. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The glory of God to conceal a thing, the honor of kings to search it out. Noble people, people of depth, kings, spend time studying, thinking, searching out a matter. The dull, the shallow, the person who doesn't care, he just goes along with the flow, will not study it out. Will not think about it. Accepts it. Okay, that's just it. That's just it. Okay, now what's well, for supper? What restaurant are we going from? Church is over. Where are we going? That's shallow. There's no depth to you if you're like that. That, that proverb right there tells me you want to be a king, you want to have a kingdom, you want to rule, you want to be in charge, you need to search out things. You don't just inherit it because you were born into a royal family. Do you think that those people in those royal families just, okay, and I'll just sit on the throne and tell you what you're supposed to do. Do you not think they go through training? Do you not think that they're taught etiquette, how to deal with foreign dignitaries? There's a little more to being a king than just you just were born a son of the king and when he dies, you become the king. We don't think about that, do we? There's a little more to being a Christian than just going to church, hearing it, go to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. so true. I love it when I see people take notes. Amen? I love it when you take notes. I love it when you talk about it after the message is over and that's what we do here when, when we end the message is we sit around and discuss it before we eat amen number three deep people listen more than they speak they listen more than they speak back to the book of James chapter one James chapter 1, verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear and slow to speak. I can tell shallow people because they do an awful lot of talking. But I can also tell you just because a person's quiet does not mean they're deep. Mm -hmm. Don't assume because someone barely speaks that they're sitting there taking it all in. They may be zoned out. Mm -hmm. There may be just, you know, your child or your husband or your wife or your supervisor, or whoever you're trying to talk to, that person may not have any depth and may, they may sit there and glare at you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Have you ever been on the telephone with someone and you don't know what, what they're doing on the other end and they're talking every now and then in response? Do you know what I've, I've done with people? It's just kind of seeing if, if they was really even caring about it. They just want to tell the story if they just want to be, you know, I knew what they were, they was going to tell me, lay the phone down, come back every now and then, hello, uh-huh, yeah. Wow, yeah. You know, you can do that to some people. They're just telling a story. A person can be doing that to you. They can be, you know, you're sitting there trying to tell them something seriously and they're, just because they're not arguing with you, it does not mean they're listening. Mm -hmm. We need to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Deep people listen more than they speak. They take it in, right? That's depth. They're not the one who's going to voice their opinion. Let's look at Proverbs 18 and 2. Have you ever noticed there's some people in this world 
they've already got an opinion. You could ask them what's the best alarm clock on the planet. They are, they've already studied it out. Well, I just knew it. I just know this. I mean, it could be something out in the blue, and they already know so much about so much. You don't even need to to ask anybody but them because they already know the answer. At Proverbs eighteen two, a fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. It literally means that he loves to express his own opinion. A fool loves to express his own opinion. Person who's not of depth, a person who's a shallow person, you know, while they may not be very vocal, when they are vocal, it's like Facebook or somewhere where they're not going to get in trouble. You know, a road rage is that way because people behind the glass window, they don't believe anything's going to happen to them. And, you know, they can just make a hand gesture to the person or cuss them out or whatever, or just swerve over there. Things that you would never do standing side by side because maybe they're they just don't want to get in trouble, but they're, they're sure bold about it when they can post. Look, look at some of these uh, comments on YouTube videos. There's always somebody in the crowd. It doesn't matter if it's the greatest song that was ever written, if it's the most un fascinating video event of the year, there'll be somebody not like it. The music was too loud. I didn't think the, the musician knew what he was doing. Well, he got off key on that one note. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for something. It's, they believe it's their point, their job in life to pick out at something. And we've got people in the church that way. Amen. Well, pastoral, you know, you need to give more about hell and, and sin and judgment. Pastor, we need to hear more sermons on the book of Revelation. Pastor, we need to deal with this youth. This youth ain't got no no leadership. We need, we got we got to do something with these youth, Pastor. Amazing how many people are armchair quarterbacks mm -hmm. in the church, right? I mean, we have people that they know all about it. Well, I've been listening to preaching for 50 years, and I know more about it than this young preacher that comes in here. But you're not a preacher, and you're not doing it, and you're not spreading the gospel, but you know about how to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to run a bulldozer, but I've seen people do it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I bet you these boys believe they can operate a bulldozer. They've seen the man do this. He operates both arms and both feet. Jonathan, you run a bulldozer? Yes. Sir. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Definitely. Did, the first time you ran it, did you? Was it awkward? It's very awkward. <laughs> I know, but we all, all us men in here today, believe we can run a bulldozer. But Jonathan says it's not as easy as it looks. Right. So I mean, we we all believe it's a lot easier than it is. If we've got depth about us, hey, maybe there's something that I don't understand. I always said when I was teaching someone to fly fish, when I was teaching them to cast, that men that have been fishing all their lives were the hardest to teach. Children and women that fished very little, they listened to what I was saying. And I, and I always say, you know, there's two stops that's very important in casting. You stop and you stop and you stop and you stop. And you can do that in a time motion. You go one, two, three, four, <coughs> one, two, three three, four. And I sit there and explained it to men and then I handed it to him and I said, okay, you try it. Right? And it's like, did you not listen to what I was saying? Well, I'm a bass fisherman. And they get out there and they're just, they got a knot in the air. No? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And that line will straighten out and straighten out and straighten out and straighten out, and you can learn to throw it anywhere you want to. Angie was one of the quickest people I ever taught to fly fish. Within two minutes, she was catching fish and outdoing me, and I ended up just giving her my fly rod and going to buy me another one. She said, this, this thing's perfect. That's the perfect weight, and I just can't believe how the fun this is. And I mean, she was catching fish in two minutes, and I've got men that, I, that I've taught several times, and they still can't cast so the thing is, we need to be ready to listen more than we speak, right? We need to be ready to study on things before we really think we can run the bulldozer. We need to study that thing. Mm -hmm. Amen? Okay, enough on number three. Number four, deep people think through the consequences of their behavior. How many of us, as a rule, 
we really consider our mistakes. We really think about what's happened because of our decisions. That is a person of death. We, we actually spend time to evaluate accidents, to evaluate bad relationships, to evaluate things we said to our wives that we shouldn't have said. Amen? If you're a husband, future husband, you're going to need this, guys. Evaluate. I hurt her feelings. I made her cry. What did I do? You know? I mean, men, are, men sometimes are so dull, so shallow about that. They, I don't even know what I said. Well, find out what you said. Find out what the problem is and straighten it out. Let's look at Haggai chapter 1. Take me a minute. One of those elusive books. Haggai, chapter one, verse five. Now therefore saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. You drink, but ye are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I think that I could give a message on that right there alone. That right there is depth. What verse was it? Hmm? What verse? Uh, Haggai chapter 1, 5 through 7. Now look at the things that God says to these people to listen to. You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink and you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. The things that you're doing, you're wasting your time on. The things that you're doing is for naught. All your work and all your production, you're going into something that is not productive, is not reaping benefits. Consider your ways, and why are you doing it this way? You have the person who says, I can't ever get ahead. I can't ever get ahead. Nobody will help me. The man that sat there at the, um, when the, spring would boil up and Jesus went down and and the man and he says what's going on and the man said I sit here while the water boils up but there's nobody to put me in nobody help nobody here to help me I've been on welfare and food stamps for years and years I can't seem to get ahead why are you on welfare and food stamps are you an able-bodied person right I mean why why is it somebody else's fault why can't it be your fault i i can't ever get ahead i just keep having children and nobody will take care of them you have children they're your responsibility to take care of them it's not the society's responsibility to take care of them i can't ever seem to get ahead i've been working here in this job for 20 years and i'm still making barely above minimum wage why are you still in that job amen right why don't you do something about you? And I'm just talking about practical things in life. This is a shallow person that believes that they can work a minimum wage job and try to get ahead. You know, minimum wage jobs are for people out of high school or like kids in, su in summer time between classes. Minimum wage jobs are not for people that want to uh, be breadwinners or someone who's running a home and has children. You need to get some training. You need to do a little something different, mm -hmm. right? Consider your ways. If you are a person of depth, you consider the consequences of your behavior. You consider, hey, it might be my, my fault. Hey, it might be something that I did, something that I said. And you consider that so you are a person of depth. Proverbs 24, 16. Proverbs 24, 16. I've only picked two verses for each of these. 
Um, but understand there can be a lot more. Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. A just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked fall, shall fall into mischief. A person of depth may stumble again and again and again, but they will rise again. They will keep trying to get up and go through it. Uh, how many of you, when you learn to ride a bicycle, got up and rode the first time you ever did, or did you fall a couple of times, right? We all did. How many of you roller skated and from the day you got stood up on your skates, you never fell? We all fell. And how many of you that's married never made mistakes? People are lying to you if you say, we've never had a problem in our marriage. We've never quarreled or fought one time. You, sir, are a liar, mm -hmm. right? I mean, relationships, there's going to be problems. People that roller skate, you're going to stumble with it. If you're a Christian, you're going to make mistakes. Your pastor's going to make mistakes. If you're a person of depth, you're going to see that you can get up and try again. Get up and try again. Amen? And the last one, deep people work to get past their egos. This is Romans 12 for both of these passages. Romans 12, so this will be our last passage today. Deep people work to get past their egos. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So you do not need to think yourself better than someone else. You do not need to judge yourself more spiritual, smarter, deeper. Even if you're a person of depth, you understand that your ego can get in the way. Right? You understand that you can get all puffed up of, look how well I did. Look at how look at how good I am. I've been watching a series uh, where these men are competing, men and women. They're competing in uh, different types of shooting and targets. They're they're not just shooting guns. There are tomahawks and there are bows and arrows. And uh, watched an episode last night where they even used rocks. It's like it's all about the target. It's all about shooting. And they're competing against each other. These men come from a law enforcement background, military background, amateur uh, archers, um, pistol shooting competition. It's, it's kind of interesting the broad range that these people come in from. Every one of them have such huge egos. Well, I'm a world champion. I've been in the Olympics shooting in this. I know I'm going to win. They, they interview them in between the, the little target uh, practices and oh I've got this one I, this is my weapon this is my gun I, this, I've trained more in this in the military than anything else and they get such big heads about it they usually go in there and mess up Christians are like that we know the Bible backwards and forwards I've been listening to the pastor I've been memorizing scripture I know the scripture is memorized somebody's going to shut you down your big ego will get in there you're going to, you're using it as the double-edged sword to try to get in there and shut somebody down because they're so dumb and you're so smart. You're going to fall. Amen. Deep people work to get past their egos. Your ego is your flesh. That's the carnal side of you as a Christian. Your flesh that likes to think that you're really good. You're a good Christian. You're a mature Christian. You're a Christian that's had, that's had um, great crops. Now, a farmer that has got produced a crop of corn six, seven years in a row, he believes, I got this down now. I know how it's going to work. I know I get in there on April 21st and plant that, or a lot of people plant on Good Friday. I get in there and I plant, 
that's when I've planted every year. I've had success with it. You're going to get thrown a curveball with Mother Nature. Or some pest is going to come in that's never been there in your field before. Or something's going to happen. And you can look down on the small farmer, the guy that says, he's, I'm struggling, and I get out here with a hoe, and I grow a little bit of corn, I get one bushel, and you get a thousand bushels. I got a bushel. And you laugh at him, and you get out there, and you're going to have a drought. And your entire field of corn, sir, will fall. There's a road that I passed down through near Talladega. There's hundreds of acres of corn. And it grows beautiful and green every year, mostly. And one year I came through there and there was a drought. And that field of corn, as far as the eye could see, was withered. I, I guarantee you there was not an ear of corn in that field. That corn withered and died before it ever produced a ear, before it ever tossed. You as a Christian, don't get the big head because you've had success in the past. Make sure you understand that things happen and you'll be thrown a curveball. The enemy knows the buttons to push on you. He knows what to challenge you with. He's been doing this and this and this and not had success. They're going to go back and they're going to make a new game plan. The demons will love to come in and throw something else at you. So just because you think you've got it all down, that you're the mature Christian that you are, and you've seen this before, you've seen this before, you've seen this before, you're going to have something that you say, I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I told you this message is going to be about this one thing. It's really about depth, isn't it? It's about depth. Depth in ourselves and depth in the people that we're working with. Understanding why the seed may either take place and root quickly and we don't, and then it just goes away, or we just keep trying to work that and work that and work that. Don't get discouraged because you've thrown seed out and it's just bounced off. Don't get discouraged in that. Keep planting the seed. Keep working in your own life to get that depth that you need to understand the Word of God, to understand what's happening in your life. The depth, even in ourselves, to understand someone else's shallowness. Amen? Because other people that can be shallow, we're, we look at them and we want to just hold their face in our hands and say, listen to me. You're not listening, right? Have patience with that person. We all have times where we have stony hearts. We have a certain place. And if you've got a, an, an attitude where when somebody deals with you and you, you swallow every now and then because you don't want to cry. Or, that's, that's shallow. That's shallow. Amen? You know, it's a major thing to go out and turn ground. It's a, it's a massive effort to turn it with a shovel, isn't it? That, gr that ground can be so hard. We struggled out here yesterday, got out and nearly got too hot working the, the garden and it was just difficult to weed, difficult to, to work. Um, has to be broken up. Breaking up is a difficult thing, right? Breaking up the soil, it's hard, it's a lot of work. But it's worth it in the end. There is a, it's a good analogy, but there's a new type farming fairly new called no-till farming where they use a seed drill and they go along on top of the ground they never turn the earth they have a seed drill that goes in and it punches the ground and it plants the seed and the theory is every time you turn the ground you actually bring weeds to the surface you actually are loosening it for the weeds and if you can get the weeds down and then put in your your crop uh, that's the way a lot of this stuff's grown. Now, I have to tell you, spiritually, people are trying that too. You know, they're trying to not till, till the earth. They're trying to not till. They're, we're using some no-till preaching here. The no-till preaching is you come in and I give you a laser light show and some rock band and make you want to come back again next week and we're going to have free popcorn on the way out to the parking lot. Well, hey, that just appeals to my flesh. I'm going to come back over there. I like that brother. I like that pastor. He wears a gold earring and he looks like he's a, like somebody posted this last week, a reject from a boy band. You know, he looks like he used to be in, in some boys to men or something years ago. 
But I like him. He's my kind of preacher. Your kind of preacher ought to be the kind that gets results in you, and he changes you and challenges you, right? Imagine if a coach comes into a brand-new football team and he says, I don't even need to tell anything. You guys know how, how the game works. Let's just get out there and play. He's not much of a coach, is he? And he says, I tell you what, I'm going to take you guys shopping, get you new football outfits, and you buy new pads, new helmets, and I, I, I'm going to take you to the movies after that. Wow, I like this football team. We get to go to the movies. And you get up there on Friday night, and you're going to lose your game. You know? And that pastor, he is not much of a pastor. He's getting you through Sunday session, and he wants you to come back in because you're going to give a little money, and that's what it's about. And that's about as honest as I can tell you. That man is no kind of a pastor or shepherd. He wants people to come in there so he can grow his church, so he can get his, his budget up. I want to be a farmer that tills the soil, no matter how hard it is. You know, when I'm going through, and this is kind of dumb to continue on with this, but when I'm going through and plowing, my little tractor, it's fairly small. I can be setting my plow deep and I can go through a place and it just bogs down and it's full of drive and all the four wheels are spinning. And I know I've hit a root or I know I've hit a rock or something that's snagging it up or just a real hard place in the soil. And I have to lift that plow up and I know I've got to go over that again. Now some of you need to hear this because there's some places you've dealt with in your life or in someone else's life that hangs you up and you think, I guess I need to just work around that. If you're doing that, keep plowing. Keep plowing, amen? Because what happens is I eventually break that up I get that root out. I get that stone out. I've, I've up-earthed some amazingly big things in my garden that, that I've been working for years, and all of a sudden they come up. And I, and I hit it with the same plow and same tractor I use every year. So if you're doing that in somebody's life, keep plowing, amen, because you'll get results. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today that you've given us the answer for a stony heart. You've given us the answer for shallowness it's depth and we need depth in Christ today Lord my original message was just going to be very generic to get depth in Christ we have to study and pray and seek God and that's the quick answer but the long and the deep answer is a little more than that and we father we pray that you would give us a little more we want to be better Christians we want to be better at what we do so that we have depth we have fullness we don't want to be an inch deep and a mile wide. We want to be a mile deep and an inch wide <coughs> and to intensively grow and intensively farm. And I just thank you, Father, that this word is going out, will not return void, Father. Give peace to those who have sown helplessly into their lives. And, Father, give them encouragement that there is soil out there ready to hear. There is soil that is ready to be worked. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs>